Thank you for coming to the session today. Uh, my name is James Hodkinson, and we'll be talking on bringing a culture of static, well, from static to ecstatic, bringing a culture of analytics to Dyson. So, very excited to be with you today. Hopefully, you can learn from this session. So, um, I also want to introduce with, to you Matthew Dean, Matt Dean. He's a senior business analyst who works in my team, and he's recently passed his BCS diploma in business analysis. So, well done, Matt. Okay, James, uh, thanks very much. So, um, why did we agree to do this? Why are we here? It's a good question. So, the reason we're here is because um, Tableau asked us to come and speak at the conference. They saw what we'd done at Dyson and they thought it would be a good story to share with you all. Okay, so, so what's in it for you then? So, it's a good question. What's in it for us? What's in it for us is, the main thing is we get to network with you guys. And hopefully it's something that you know, we find that we've got in common, we can share, we can help you, you can help us. And the second thing is it's a, it's a good opportunity to share what Dyson do with you and to try and attract talent if you want to come work at Dyson and you're great at Tableau, we'd love to have you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, and, so, and so what's in it for them? Yeah, well, hopefully, like I kind of said, um, hopefully what we show you will be some, of some benefit. Hopefully the problems we've had might be similar to the problems you're having, and hopefully that will help you in your journey of analytics and Tableau wherever you're working. Thanks, James. Okay. So just a quick agenda. We're going to be talking a little bit about what is Dyson, who are Dyson, um, and then we'll talk about how we change from static to ecstatic reporting, and then some of the challenges we've faced and some of them we've overcome. Um, I guess initially, who here has used the Dyson ever before? Who here has used the Dyson in the last 24 hours? This should be everyone in the room because yeah. we've got our hand dryers in the toilets. So if you didn't put your hand up, you didn't wash your hands. That's not good. <laughs> so, um, Dyson, this is James Dyson, Sir James Dyson, our founder, who started the company about 30 years ago. Inspirational guy. Um, do you all recognise this guy? I don't know in terms of he's, is he common across Europe? Do you know who he is, generally? It's mostly nods. Um, so our mission statement is we solve the problems others ignore. Um, but I'll I'll short a video to show you where James Dyson explains it in person. So I'm just going to play this for you now. In a way, problem solving is a disease. You know, you, you, you want to do it, and uh, although each one's a headache, um, it's, it's there to be solved. It's a, it's a steeple to climb, it's a mountain to climb. Mountaineers have that problem, that disease, and that, we, we have that. We were a group of engineers starting to want to make a different type of product with better technology, and we've carried on like that. I have 35 years experience of making things, and it's taught me a lot. It's no good just being a designer. You've got to make a product that works better. Things are too heavy, things are too polluting, things use too much energy, things don't perform as well as they should, things don't last as long as they should. There are just hundreds of problems in every product. What we're trying to do every day is make products work better. And if we develop breakthrough technology like high-speed electric motors, for me that's a huge success. Because this enables so many products to perform so well. If you always do what you know is going to work, then okay, you'll have less failure, but you'll never make a substantive change or breakthrough. What we're doing is trying to do something different and better, trying to advance technology, trying to advance what a product can do. So we're risk-taking all the time. We're stepping off into the unknown, sort of grand word, but we're pioneering. And I think we've gathered around as a group of people who, who want to do that. It's not a question of coming in to make money, we're coming in to, to make the business grow. We come in to make better technology and design, develop better performing products. Great. Thanks, you, James. So that's a little bit about the background to Dyson. Um, most people probably recognize Dyson for the vacuum cleaners that we make. Um, however, we have lots of other categories that we've branched out into over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, it's an interesting one. When I first uh, went for an interview at Dyson about eight years ago, I was told by everyone before I go there, don't mention the word Hoover in the interview, because obviously that's what people generically call a vacuum cleaner generally. So I've made a point, I'm not going to say Hoover. I said it three times in the interview. 
Still got the job, so they were very generous to me. So yeah, Dyson have been successful. We've moved into different categories. Um, we've had turnover, it's been up 40% uh, last uh, financial year, up to three and a half billion. And the profit is up 27% to 800 million. Uh, we've got about 4,000 engineers and scientists working globally within R&D, which is a department uh, Matt and I work in. Um, just to give you the scale of it, we manufacture 80,000 machines every single day. So it's large scale, it's, it's a global business. Um, we've recently launched a hairdryer, which is very exciting. Anyone here got a hairdryer from Dyson? Generally the Dyson employees putting their hands up actually. But <laughs> it's a great product. It's not cheap, but it is the best one out there, I promise you. Um, but the, the exciting news is um, we're going to be expanding. You may have heard this in the news. We're expanding to start making electric vehicles. So we're going to compete with all those big players out there. Now, most things in Dyson are incredibly top secret. So we work in a building where we have to thumb scan to get in through the door. It's more secure than most MOD sites. The secrets are very important to James Dyson. But exclusively today, I can actually show you the prototype of what the first Dyson electric vehicle is going to look like. We need to promise not to share it outside of these four walls. So here is the image of what <laughs> the first vehicle. It dries your hands and your hair as you're driving along, and it cleans the floor as well. So it's got everything to it. Okay, so background in terms of data. Um, Dyson started in 1989 with one person, Sir James Dyson. Now we're around 12,000 and we've expanded massively in the last sort of three or four years. This has changed the perspective of why data is important. At the beginning, when there's only one or 10 or 50 people, you can talk to everybody and everyone knew what was important. The expert was the person. The time's gone by, we've started to introduce automated reporting. Data has become more important. Where we want to get to is where we have advanced analytics, where we're forecasting, where we're doing machine learning. We're not there yet. We're still driving to turn Dyson into that company, but we are on that journey. And the reason is because of the growth in terms of size. Uh, where we've come from. So when I took over the, um, the data team a couple of years back, uh, we had a very static reporting system. Um, it wasn't very sophisticated at all. Um, hopefully no one here has such a bad system as what I'm about to show you. Uh, but, we, but you may have. Um, we had a source system, uh, we had a few source systems, and we used to manually, manually extract it into Excel files. We had hundreds of Excel files storing lots of data in. Using lots of formulas, we then eventually turn them into flat PDF files, load them into a basic website, and that was our reporting system. So it wasn't great. We know we needed to change. It wasn't very flexible. It took 18 hours for a team of uh, Malaysian data analysts to do this every day. Um, it was unpopular, um, and it silos of data. Data stuck in your Excel. It wasn't very useful or beneficial for anyone. So we needed to make a change. Um, what we moved to was a data warehouse architecture. So we installed um, a data warehouse architecture, which was pulling from our five main source systems. You can see them on the left there. So we have product data, and we use a PLM system called Team Center. Uh, we have lots of electronics data stored in Atlassian products, if you've heard of those. Uh, Project Server, that's a Microsoft product. Um, the two at the bottom are kind of internal applications storing resource and storing people data. So we now have an automated process. We pull all this into a SQL Server using automated tools every day, and it's a lot better now, a lot nicer place to start from. Um, if anyone here, by the way, uses either Team Center or Atlassian, I'd be very interested to talk to you afterwards to see how you are integrating those systems. Um, Team Center particularly is a big challenge, but I know lots of people would use it. It's quite engineering focused. But if anyone does, please come and talk and we can share. What's, uh, what's Team Center for, James? Team Center is a system um, to store the CAD drawings, to store the part information, to store the tests and the changes. So it's very engineering focused. So it's a product lifecycle management. Exactly, yeah. Product lifecycle management, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we had our data consolidation, and then finally uh, we built a quite nice-looking uh, web server where we host our Tableau reports. We call it Control Tower. Um, that's the, the phrase our CEO uses to describe the hub of where he wants to go to look at all his data and analytics. Okay, here is one of our actual dashboards. This is, in fact, our most popular dashboard. Um, this is the front page of it. It's interactive, and you can drill through to find details. 
but ultimately it's showing you the project health. Now we've blurred out the category images and the project names just for sensitivity, but you could probably guess what the, the products are at the top. We didn't do it very well, <laughs> purposely. Um, but this is, is our most popular dashboard. It had 35,000 views already. And in fact, the, the developer, the tablet developer that helped us build this is actually sitting here. He doesn't work for Dyson anymore. But it's a guy called Maxim Sheikh. Maxim, put your hand up. Well done, Mac. Well done, Mac. <laughs> I did tell him I wasn't showing everyone the best screen. It's, it's more interactive and interesting further down. But it's a key report for Dyson, and it's changed the way we do product development because now people are aware of what these are effectively is KPI metrics. And obviously, red is bad and green is good, so the project teams can see where they're on track, where they need to put their focus and energy. Um, here's another report which is key at Dyson. Again, a very simple visualization, but this is showing stacked resource, stacked demand, where we need to put people onto projects over time. You can see it's broken down by different dimensions, either category, um, by team, or by team defined, and the different sections or the different amount of people we need as time goes by. And then we can map over there, um, I think this is the actual headcount line, the black line here to see if we're going to be in deficit or not. So it's a key report that's used by a lot of the senior managers at Dyson. Okay, so growth in usage. Um, since we launched, which was about June 17, we launched with um, launching Tableau Server. Actually, who here has Tableau Server as opposed to desktop? So probably maybe about half the people have Tableau Server. So we launched Tableau Server in June of 2017. Um, and since we launched, um, we were, before then we had named users and we had 100 or so users. Since then, it's kind of, the growth has been really, really, really good. It hasn't carried on at the same trajectory. And if I'm being honest, we've had some dips since the peak of this chart, which was 1,000. But we did find that when we launched Tableau, people really loved what they saw, especially in comparison to what they had previously with static PDF files. They've now got an interactive visualization they can drill into and they can find out more insight. Um, so... I'm going to hand you over to Matt Dean now, who's going to talk to you about some business challenges. Um, Matt's been with Dyson about two and a half years. Uh, what I love about Matt is he's passionate about what the customers want and what they need. He really helps the customers, and he's really good at getting stuff done. You know, some people, you can trust them to get stuff done. Matt's one of those people. Plus, he's a really good drummer. Thanks, James. That's great. I really love what you were saying there about bringing in the data warehouse and your tenacity of bringing data into Dyson and really making it what it is today so that we can get products to market faster. People don't really appreciate what journey James has been on to do this. Uh, bringing a data warehouse into an environment like Dyson is very difficult. Predominantly, we work with a lot of engineers and they like doing things. They like getting products out the door. They don't really want to stop and measure things. So James had to work really hard to get this in and it's a testament to Dyson that he's done this. Also, this represents what James Dyson was talking about in his video, about a mountain to climb and the things that we've had to overcome. And today, I really want to talk to you about the business challenges that we've had in what we've done. So, we, what we're going to talk about is the business perspective, and there's actually a problem of opportunity. I'll go into a little bit more about this in a moment. Is the customer always right? How we've built an audience, and whether or not you can actually sustain an audience. Is it right to try and sustain an audience? So, the problem with opportunity. The problem with opportunities is that we only have opportunities because we're trying to fix a problem. Does that make sense? Let me go into a bit more detail. So the problem with opportunities is that we only have them to fix problems. The problem that we had as an organization is that, we're, as I said earlier, we're so busy doing things that we don't actually know what we want to measure. The problem that we had as a data team is that we had to try and keep up with that and try and get people something that they wanted. We know that we wanted Tableau. It tasted good. It felt good. It did all the things that our static predecessor couldn't. And as we've worked with Tableau, we've been able to expand our data sets to really get our engineers what they need. You know, it's really good getting people what they need because you can really start to see what you're trying to do. So I want to share a bit of the journey that we've been on uh, with this exact business challenge and show you what's happened along the way. So we know the customer's always right. At first, we invested much time in singular data sets 
And the data set I want to talk to you about today is our resource data set that James was starting to show you earlier on. So this is what happened when we asked the customers what they wanted. Basically, they wanted what they had before, but they wanted it interactive. So first of all, they wanted us to do averages. Then they wanted us to do actuals. Then they wanted to know about today and tomorrow. Of course, they wanted to know about things in their teams. They wanted to know things about their projects. They wanted to know about their departments. And they wanted us to do some forecasting. They wanted us to do all the things they had before, but in this new interactive world. What they really wanted was all of these things. I'm now just going to go through some of the pros and cons of the things that we've done, just so that you can see whether or not the customer is always right. So, the good things that happen, we understood all of the requirements that our customers wanted. There were a lot of them. We met up with lots of stakeholders across all parts of the organization to find out what they needed. And we, under, we had a really good, deep understanding of the data that we were trying to build. And last but not least, we got to build loads of visualizations in Tableau using loads of different styles. The things that didn't go so well was that it took ages to deliver all the requirements. And we ended up supporting too many reports. We also ended up becoming the data SMEs. And we actually end up have now looking after the user interface to look after this data set. And we have to explain why different reports say different things about exactly the same data set. It's very difficult to answer. So in summary, what we did here was we created 17 reports about the same data set, and we now support them. And at the end of the project to build all the reports, we spent three to four weeks analyzing all of the data that came from those reports, and we built a report to analyze that data. So my question, really, to myself after doing this is, would we do it again? And the answer is yes, we would do it again. Because in the classic style of uh, working in an agile environment, we gave people something that they didn't have before. We gave them something to work with and something to improve on. Up until this point, they were still working with static reports. But now they're starting able, people are starting to be able to play with the data and visualize what it could look like. So I want to talk to you about how we've built an audience. Some of this was really difficult. We flew around the world, talking to our customers, talking to people in our organization. And we did around about 40 to 50 workshops, trying to find out what people needed and working out how we should communicate with customers. And as you can see, we worked really hard. We were tenacious in getting our message across. <laughs> We've communicated with our customers at every single stage of this journey. And it's been really useful and really helpful for them and for us to understand what they need and how we can help them better. So a message about sustaining an audience. As the boss once said, sustaining an audience is hard. The existence of a data team in a large organization like Dyson depends on reaching the right audience and giving them what they need to make intuitive decisions about how they drive products to market faster. So I'm now going to talk to you about the sustaining audience thing and whether or not um, sustaining audiences is, is the right thing to be worried about. So adoption to a new product like, like Tableau into our organization shouldn't necessarily be the thing you're worried about because occasionally some people may only need to see a visualization once to go and do something about it. And of course we have data so that we can go and do things. You know, the point of the, point of the information and the data that we've got is not that it's just a report to say we've got a problem. It's so that we can go and do things about it. The journey that we've been on, you saw this, this drawing earlier that James showed you. And what this is, is just the same thing, but by weeks. And we've got three key points in our journey here. So point A, which was our first initial rise, was when we initially went live with Tableau. And we gave people something to play with. They were really engaged. They picked up on it and kind of just peered out a little bit. You know, a few people still interested. And then at point B, uh, near Christmas, of last year, we started to tell people what we'd done. So basically summarizing, this is what we've introduced, this is what's really good about Tableau, and people got interested again, but it quickly fell off. And at point C, we uh, started communicating to our customers on a regular basis. We created a bulletin, got people interested in what we're doing, and now we're, we're generally starting to see these peaks every time we get a bulletin out. 
so people are getting interested, but again, sustaining an audience isn't necessarily the right thing to do, because as I said before, people may only need to see things once to really enjoy it. Okay, so I'm just going to share with you some of the successes that we've had. Um, we've had a lot of success with uh, the people analysis that we've done. Um, areas such as HR, uh, our management teams, pretty much everybody is interested in people data. It's a very interesting data set. Um, I'll share, share with you some of the communications that we've had and how we've created a new mission statement and how it's been trying to embed that culture into our area. And then lastly, I'm going to share with you the, the difficulties that we've had with our stakeholder engagement and some of the positives that we've had from that as well. So I'll start with the person-focused analysis. Now, just before I go on to this next slide, take a moment to look at this because this is one of my favourite visualisations that we've done. I do really like this one. Here there are around 12,000 stars. Each one of these stars represents somebody that works at Dyson. And here we've all got our own star. And we're looking at several different things here. We're looking at your location by color. We're looking at how many levels away from James Dyson you are. And we're looking at how long you've been in the organization. When you show people a group photo, generally the first thing they'll do is try and find themselves try and find out how they're looking on that day. Am I looking OK? How's my mate looking? How's he looking? How's, how's everyone looking? Where's, how's my boss looking? You know, all of those things are on here. And so we've really managed to engage people through this people data. And of course, as soon as you give people this, they really want to just start going in and finding out more about who they are, where they work, how long they've been at the organization. It's a great reminder of all the things that you do at your company and why you're there. So opening up the Dyson universe to everyone has been a really important thing for us. And actually, it's captured engagement from far outside of the research design development area that we're in at the moment. We regularly get requests from the central part of the organization to really start diving into this data. As far as the HR function is concerned, all of our kind of HR are really interested in looking at this and actually utilizing it around their kind of people data and how they drive that forward. Since we did this report, we've actually created loads more people reports. People are just really interested generally in all the different things you can see. So you take your kind of your classic structural diagrams of, of what your resource looks like, and, and we've created more of those, but within Tableau. OK, so I'm going to talk to you a bit more about our communications. So this is our control tower that we've, uh, that we've recently created. It's a portal to to keep all of our engineers interested in all the things that we do. And we've broken out our product development areas into all of their different kind of hierarchies at the top. We have this scrolling banner that goes through the middle, so just communicating the new things that we're doing so that we can really talk to our customers. We tried to link everything together to start engaging with our people and really giving them some comms that we can be proud of and that they can, it can be clear what they need to do with it. It hosts a number of different types of reports, including the personal ones that I showed you a moment ago. But more importantly, it helps to drive the KPIs that really push our business forward. OK, so I want to talk to you a little bit about our mission statement. So about a year ago, we created a mission statement that was here, uh, here on the board um, to enable data-driven decisions for product development using visual analytics. So the point of this mission statement was that we had something to live to. And actually, it's, it's worked pretty well so far, but we're now in the position where we want to change this. We've already enabled data-driven decisions, and now we want to start pushing towards how we actually drive decisions, not just enable them. Enablement is great, but actually we need to be driving things. So the, the culture of adding this in has been quite, great, quite good for us, because it's given us something to live to. Our data warehouse and data visualization system has given us this leap that we've been able to do this in liberating data for people. Our, our audience regularly now barters for our time to try and get us to, to do reports for them because of, this, because of this mission statement. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about is uh, stakeholder engagement. So really passionate for me. As James said earlier on, I'm a business analyst at Dyson. And the thing I care about most really is my stakeholders and what they're doing and what they're up to. So we created this quadrant to show what our people are doing and what they're up to. 
And if you take a moment to look at this, you can see that we've got several different things going on here. So the color of the dot uh, relates to the location of the team. We've then got the size of the dot being how many people are in that team. And then obviously the distance this way is how many views per user in that team. And then also going up the left hand side, we have the, uh, the engagement as well. And as you can see, there's quite a good spread of teams. The key thing for us with this slide is that we've been able to use the people at the top right hand side to influence the people at the bottom left hand side to increase the engagement and the amount of times that people hit the reports. We're working hard with the people at the bottom left as well to understand what they need. This really helps us to drive forward with our strategy and really try and increase what people do with their data. It's a really good way of measuring what we've got and where we need to go. And for the long term, it helps us to get decisions from people uh, to what they need to do. That's about it from me. I'm going to hand you back over to James. What James didn't tell you is James is also a pretty good drummer. He's also a very good bass player, and he likes playing keyboard. Here you go, James. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Maybe next year we'll get a chance to play on the band downstairs. That'd be good fun. Great. So, yeah, we've had an interesting journey uh, working with the business users, and that's probably the biggest challenge of all. I don't know if you'd all agree, but technically there's always challenges. We've got to try and solve them. But it's actually it's interactions with people, trying to understand what they want, how we can help them, how we can get on together is probably the biggest challenge, I think, ultimately. Um, what Matt said about the challenge of building the data warehouse, that was the biggest challenge of this whole piece for me, like, he, like Matt mentioned. Very, very difficult, really, really hard work to persuade people within IT, particularly for us, that building a data warehouse is a good idea. In fact, I have lots of conversations with individuals from IT who would talk about the concept as being insane. Why would you take your data out of your source system and build a warehouse? That's absolutely insane. So that's what we were working against. So it was a challenge. If you're if you're having challenges where you are with any element of this, um, I guess just be encouraged that you know, working hard, we can get through them. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about a few of the actual technical challenges. So if you're technical, this will be good for you. If not, um, hopefully there'll be some benefit to what I'm going to share. So uh, these are the five areas we're going to look into in terms of the challenges we've had and how we've tried to solve them. So first of all, um, this is a picture of Dyson. This is um, where we sit and have our lunch and where the research and MPI happens. So if there's anyone from Dyson here, you might see yourself on that picture. You never know, you might be sitting there in the sun. Um, we're in Malmesbury, which um, is out in the Cotswolds. So those of you who are from the UK will know it's a very leafy, nice area. If you're from um, another country, it's, it's way away from London, near kind of Swindon Way. Um, it's nice, lovely location, lots of green. Um, this is our technical specification um, for our server. So we have an eight-core Tabo server. Uh, we've now configured it, so um, there's eight CPUs for those of you who don't know, and you can choose which ones focus on the live queries the users are accessing and which ones focus on the extracts you're running in the background. So we've configured ours now to favor um, 6.2 um, for the live, but it wasn't always that way, so we had some advice from, um, well, Mike Lowe over here um, from the Information Lab. He helped us with some advice about how to best set that up, so now we've change to this configuration. Um, we've had about, well, these, the user growth was 130 to almost 1,300 in total now, over 18 months. And then just in terms of the desktop, the actual analysts who create the tableaus, um, that's changed from about 10 to 150. So it's really taken off at Dyson. Uh, we're one of many teams that are using it. Uh, we've got the largest audience within R&D, but there's many teams now that are, are also on the same journey. And our main data sources are our new SQL data warehouse that we showed you about. Um, and then lots of, I guess, smaller Excel files. Um, elsewhere in Dyson, they use Amazon Web Services, start to use Google Cloud Platform, but these are the main two that we use. Um, so the problem was that we started with a virtual machine rather than a physical server, and we had our configured cores at 4.4. This, both of these things here led to poor performance. So if you've got a tablet server and you're having issues, I'd really investigate what physical kit, what kit is the server actually on. Don't trust what the IT person tells you. Speak to Tableau, speak to one of the partners to find out what kit you should have your server on. Um, and then just be really careful about how you set your configuration of the CPUs. 
Uh, we've now changed to favor um, the live VizQL uh, process. And we have a physical server, a uh, high spec um, server coming online um, this month. So that's going to boost the performance of our system as well. Um, security. So this is a big thing for Dyson. I joked earlier about you know, confidential information and showed you what we're developing. Um, but security is a big deal, and it might be for where you work as well. Um, so the question is, how secure do you want to be? Do you want to lock stock your data down? Or do you want to be, have some freedom for your data? So it's a key thing for me is you know, where you sit on a hierarchy. If you want to really go and lock it down, or if you want to totally open up and let everyone have the freedom to see it. Uh, what we want is we want to do both. We want to lock it down and give the freedom to analyze and um, collaborate. So what we did to do that um, was we wanted to distinguish what was sensitive data. Um, in some systems, in fact, our PLM team center system, if you have access to a particular project, you'll have everything. You'll see all the CAD drawings, all the images, all the descriptions, or you'll see nothing. We wanted to change that in the data warehouse world to allow people to collaborate more. So we wanted to share the non-sensitive data. So effectively, everyone who accesses our system sees every single record, but they only see certain attributes or certain columns, depending on what permissions they have available. Now, we, um, we used Kerberos authentication. Does anyone use that within their Tableau setup? V very few. So it's quite a unique problem. So um, that was a challenge for us to solve that, but ultimately it means it's your credentials when you type into your computer when you first log in, it passes that right through your systems, your, um, your Tableau server back to your database, and it tells you whether you're allowed to see that and then shows you the relevant information. So that was one technical challenge we had to solve, but it doesn't sound like it's going to affect a lot of people. Um, this probably does affect lots of people. So sharing a server. So is any, anyone here has got kids, like I have? Um, you probably know that sharing isn't a great thing from a young age. And even probably as we get older, it's no one likes necessarily to share equipment or systems because you're not in control of who's using it in which way and the effect that might have on you. So we did have this problem. So these are the different teams that actually now use Tableau Server at Dyson. Um, we are the one in red, RDD, BI. But you can see there's about 20 other teams that are using it. So this can lead to problems because we've been quite free in how we've set up our server. So in a similar vein to security of the data, how secure you make your server, I think, is really important to consider. Do you lock it down? Benefits being it's quite stable and performant, um, but it might be slower to develop stuff and quite bureaucratic in how that works. Um, or do you give people freedom? Do you allow people on a site to do whatever they like, um, to be agile and empowering, but you then get conflicting load if everyone is running an overnight extract at 1 a.m. Suddenly, well, for us, we have a global operation. So 1 a.m. in the UK is in the middle of the day over in Malaysia and Singapore. So that's a big problem. So we, that's one of the issues we had. Um, so what we decided to do, we chose freedom. Um, it's generally the approach I go for. I like to be free. But then we monitor usage. So we, we have to share the server with lots of people. And so you just do that in an, in an adult way, and then you provide analysis using Tableau on how the extracts are performing, the live users, and then you can have that discussion and say what you're doing is affecting my 500 users and so on, and then you try and work it out. So that's how we've tried to share a server. Um, the other thing is the data model. So where to store the joins, the calculations, the KPIs, the, the metrics that you're trying to deliver, where do you store that? So we have a classic um, warehouse structure with facts, fact tables and dimensions. Does anyone here actually else, who else here uses the data warehouse? Is it common for people to be connecting? Okay, so that's a good amount of people, about like 50%. So we have a system like this. Um, what we wanted to do was to create an analytical cube. Um, and interestingly enough, I think there's a talk happening after this one, talking about using cubes for Tableau. So I'm interested to go to it, because I don't know how they managed to do it. Because we had real problems connecting Tableau. We used a SQL Server Analytical Services Cube, SSAS. And Tableau didn't like it at all. Didn't like the date, the hierarchies. So I'm seeing a few nods around the room to this, this point. So we ended up creating Tableau data sources. And in these, we did our joins and our calculations. And that was the, the approach we were going on. Now, this wasn't necessarily the best performant way of doing it. So now we're revisiting this, and now we've actually created SQL views 
where we do our joins and our calculations. But it's not ideal because your data model is then stuck in lots of different views. So basically, I'm here to say we haven't solved this one. This is still a challenge, and I'm seeing some nods, which is quite nice to, nice to see. So I think Tableau are aware of this, and it's maybe a gap in the tool, and there may be other tools that you can bring in and connect to. And if any of you have solved this, I'd be interested to know how you go about storing your data model and using a warehouse and Tableau. So it's the bit that sits in the middle, I guess. Um, still work in progress. Um, in terms of load time analysis, this is a personal favorite for mine. Um, and as much as I think it, I'm passionate about the load time being good, because that's the, that's the main customer experience people see from Tableau. It's the first thing they see. They go and load a report. The spinning wheel, depending on how, lo how long your wheel spins for, is key. Um, now, out of the box, this is what Tableau gives you. It stats for load times, and it shows you a nice distribution over time, and it shows you the different reports and the distribution of which reports are slow and fast and so on. But the problem is, it's only giving you 10 days of history, because what's stored by default in the Postgres database is only 10 days worth of load times. Now, this is a real problem, um, which we got tripped up on, because we weren't doing anything with this apart from just looking at it from time to time. But when we launched back in June, and our data warehouse started to grow every week, we'd made a fundamental mistake on our logic of our data model. And every week, every report was getting slightly slower as more data entered those fact tables. And we didn't really realize, because we weren't tracking it, until we thought, this isn't right. And it's only because I'd written down somewhere a certain average load time. And then six months later, this is twice as slow. We were trying to work out why. And what it was is because we'd had a problem in our data model, which we've now resolved. But we couldn't measure it. We couldn't, we couldn't know. So big recommendation, if you haven't already, warehouse your Postgres database as soon as you can so you don't start losing that history. And then I would suggest you set some targets for load times. Now, depending on how your complex your reports are and how large your data sets are, that might be a 20-second, a 10-second, a 5-second. In my mind, it doesn't really matter what you start at. But set a target and then obviously try and get it and then better it. That's what we did. We set a 15-second average load time target, and now we're going to try and get to 10, and then we're going to try and get to 5. That's our ambition. And then monitor and improve these as time goes by. So this um, dashboard here is, is one I put together. So I'm, I'm not a great Tableau developer, so it's not the best one out there. But for me, it tells me exactly what I want to see. Is ultimately, the, the red and the green is good and bad, whether your load time is um, acceptable. And at the top, the yellow and the... I guess turquoise is whether it's an S, um, Southeast Asia experience, the users in Malaysia and Singapore, or the users in the UK and Europe, the other. So I can now see uh, by report up here, which reports are particularly um, performing badly. I've ordered it by total execution time, which some uh, Mark Kernke from Groupon suggested, rather than the slowest average report. You want to say the total execution, and then you can focus on, it might be your most popular report, but if it takes 11 seconds, if you can take two seconds out of that report, it, overall, everyone benefits more than fixing the one report that's slow that only has two users. So that's why I think sort it by total execution time, and then fix the ones which are a big problem, and try and get these, the red dashes here, these are the, um, these are the averages for the report. The idea is every one of those should be over to the left of my target of 15. Um, so that's... This is a key report for me, um, and then the, I'm particularly focusing on the average, but also the percentage loaded in 15 seconds. So this is actual, our actual data. Now, when we had our problem, because we made a mistake in our data model, the worst point we got to was only 36% of the reports were loading in 15 seconds back in May of this year. We did a whole load of work within the data team to improve that, and now we're up at 76%. Um, which is great, so a massive improvement for the user experience, and we're going to continue to do that. So I really recommend that you focus in on, on the load times. Um, James Dyson said um, in his video that he tries to make products work better, and I guess our job within data is to make the data perform better and the experience be better for the, for the users within Dyson. So that's what we've done here. Okay, so that's pretty much as finished. Um, so in summary, uh, we've talked to you a little bit about how we move from static reporting to interactive reports and ecstatic users, which generally is the case. In that. Um, we've talked about ongoing business and technical challenges where we've solved some of them and some of them are still outstanding. Um, and the, some of the key recommendations I'd say, I'd say hire a diverse team if you are a manager within your team. 
try and get multiple skills. Don't just go for the blue sort of colored analysts. Get people that are really great with people. Get people who are very creative, who can visually design stuff well, as well as your real technical data crunches. I think get diverse team is what I would say. Um, focus on your users. They're the most important people. Um, and for me, that's the experience of load time and how we communicate with our users. Um, spend time on business problems and spend money on technical problems. That one means that if you've got a bad performance server, you need to persuade IT or the budget holder to fix that by spending 10, 20, 30,000 pounds, whatever it is, because then you want to spend your time trying to speak to the customers and the business users. Um, and then I guess just admit that change is hard. Keep going. It's, it's not been easy on this journey at Dyson. It's been the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, but it is encouraging to see progress. And I guess when you look back, you can then see where you've come from. So, so that's us, really. Um, it's a little fun video to show you at the end. Um, we like a challenge at Dyson. Uh, we set our engineers a challenge every year to do something crazy. Uh, this one is about designing a cardboard go-kart to compete over a course that involves fire and water. So I'll just show you this. It's only a minute long, and then we'll ask some questions at the end. We do have, do have some fun at Dyson. So um, that's us now. So um, any questions from anyone, really, I guess? Yes. Do we have a microphone or not? No. Yeah, so the question was, what was the support from top-level management for data analysis and driven decisions? Um, not all of the senior management were supporters, um, but luckily our COO at the time was really into data. So um, a guy who's now the CEO, Jim Rowan, he was very data-driven. His, his concept was control tiles. So luckily, we had a very senior stakeholder, and he ultimately made the decision to spend the money to, to buy Tableau server, so we've got a very good advocate at the top. Say again, sorry? Yeah, great. So the question was, how do we decide which business areas to go at? Um, I don't know, what do you think, Matt? How do you suggest, how do we know who to go to? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've got to go to the people who are passionate about your data first. And uh, the great thing is that we've got a lot of people who are passionate about data. And as you could probably see from the quadrant we're looking at, the, the majority of the people we start with are our project management team. They tend to know generally because they've got a bit of time to look from the outside in at what needs to be doing. So I'd say maybe 70, 80 percent of our initial requests came from our project management team. And um, then since then have started to filter into the design teams, into the engineers and, and other areas. But yeah, I think we'd always start with the people who are going to see the most people first and then work our way out from there. Great, yeah, good question. So how do we go about training the users in Tableau Desktop? Um, so we don't have a, a complete strategy for that yet. It's growing so quickly, so fast, um, that we, we encourage people to go on the training course provided by Tableau and the partners. Um, that's what my team have done. And a lot of people have been self-taught because Tableau is quite intuitive. They've learned themselves. But that's something we're starting to think about. If we become what 
people are talking about having a centre of excellence and providing that training and support, how we do that. So, yeah, we haven't quite got there yet. Have you done that yourself or you have? How, how do you do it? Right. This lady here has provided training courses particularly for their data set, which I think is really good. So I think we've we probably did something like you did it. <laughs> Go out the back. Yeah, good question. Uh, we had lots of workshops. Um, in hindsight, maybe we could have had less, but bigger ones. We, we wanted to get in front of all the key decision makers around Dyson globally, um, which required that many uh, workshops of about, I don't know, 30 or 40 coming to each. Um, but yeah, it's hard. And then the problem is sometimes you ask everyone what they want. And if they all tell you, well, you can't obviously handle all those requests. So that's probably a loop we've been through is working out what capacity to do, what capacity do we have and only go over what you have capacity for. So it's probably a lesson, because we have, Matt, would you agree we've still got items in our Jira queue that have been there for over a year in terms of people asking yeah. for stuff? So as I was alluding to earlier, we have uh, an absolute ton of work. Um, we've probably got a good year's backlog, but most of the time it's kind of looking through that work and seeing how much business value is in there in doing those bits of work. Everybody's got an interest in data now, which is great. So we've got a really great portfolio of people who are asking us for information and now it's our job to kind of put a filter on that and really say this is really important, this is going to gain us X amount of business value or drive this decision to be made as a result of that work. Great. Yeah, so we, we just are R&D. We also have a finance data team and a... Um, well, obviously, we have a commercial uh, tablet team, a quality data team. Um, and then we have a central IT team. So the central IT team, I guess they could coordinate in terms of the licensing and the server, and they're starting to think about the training type work might be happening. Uh, we, I guess, are one of the leaders because we were one of the first teams to adopt it, and our audience is the biggest. So we, the, the far, I guess, we consume most server space and um, uh, CPU time on the server by Strongfold, that's probably why we're kind of leading. But yeah, it's, we try and work with the central IT team to try and coordinate all of us. Yeah, good question. So the question was about the impact. How did, what was the business case for doing all of this? Were we going to develop products faster or cheaper or what have you? Um, yes, we do want to do all those things. I don't think we've got to that level of analytics yet. We, um, we kind of replicated what went before and lots of status reports, like you're just tracking things over time, basic. But the, the big questions we do want to hand, look at is how can our data help us develop products faster? Um, is there a relation to the health of the project at start of production to how faulty it is when you guys buy it, that type of thing. So there's loads of things for us to do, and it's quite exciting to think about the possibilities, but I don't think we're, we're not that far along our data journey to do those really big questions yet. We're, we're definitely starting to put the, the data together for how much resource did it take to complete a project, so what would it take to potentially do something like that next time. We're not there yet, but we have that data available to us now. So we can really start to think about what is the size and shape of a project. So when we're trying to do new things in the future, we've got that kind of insight there. Luckily, because Dyson are quite ambitious and they've got, they're making lots of profit, you don't have to make as much persuasive um, business cases to maybe other companies would, because when you make an 800 million profit a year, you can chuck you know, half a million at Tableau easily. <laughs> okay. question, yes, yeah, so how do we scale up based on the transformation? Uh, we ended up using lots of contractors, 
So Mac, the guy who um, put his hand up developing one, uh, we brought in two contractors where we didn't have anyone who dedicated to tablet development pr um, previously. So that helped. Um, and then generally, um, the team has kind of grown as they're seeing the success of what we're doing. So I think um, that's been quite a good way of um, has been able to expand to transform with what we're trying to do. Um, good question. So um, I answered that when I did the similar talk at Gartner, because obviously they're more looking at all the systems. The reason we chose Tableau, have you chosen Tableau? Yes, but it's then about persuading our Why they would, sure. Yeah, so I guess we chose it because I guess for a lot of the reason that people in here would sign up to it, as much as it's very agile, it's very easy to start using it from uh, start off um, and the online community, the help that's available and the pace of development, you know, seeing how many iterations we've had in the last two years, that was a major reason why we decided to go for it. So we, we tried Click, um, Sapli Mira, um, they were the two, and then we, we also had business objects as a legacy system, and then with, with Tableau, Click, and um, Sapli Mira, Tableau was the, um, the trial that won when we kind of analyzed it internally. It was, it was far more visually appealing, wasn't it? Just yeah, in, it was. the, in the main, the, the amount of visualizations you get out the box just seem to be far more superior to the other ones. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Lady again? It's the mass point about sustaining interest. So you do the, uh, the comparison of music, and I understand the creative background. I was wondering, if I have you know, a, a Dyson hair dryer, it doesn't need to sustain my interest. Sure. And you did each time I wash my hair, and it then it's a dryer. And so I was, uh, how can we make data, data analysis Sure. I, th I think, yeah, I think what you're saying is good. What we're kind of talking about with our data here is a little bit more about the internal, uh, internal use of our data, so for actually developing the products. Um, some of the other areas of our organization who do quality data around the products um, may be able to help you more with that question. Um, but with ours, in terms of sustaining our audience, um, some of the decisions that people might have to make might be kind of a very clear picture. So we might show somebody something where um, there's simply there's simply a deficit, and it's a huge deficit. So they're able to make a quick decision straight away and move on, and they don't need to see the, the picture again. So we're not trying to sustain that person. We're actually just trying to get a message to them very quickly. Um, and I think part of what my message there was saying is don't worry about people continually going back to your report. Um, as long as they get the message, then they don't need to ever go back there again. And potentially, if it is a tracking thing, they might want to keep going back there. So they're the people you'll, you'll want to sustain. Yes? Uh, have you got any stats around the kind of benefits for increased efficiency or cost reduction that have uh, arise, arise from you using the tablet? Yeah, we did from the, um, I guess, the 18 hours saving of manpower. So obviously, you could turn that into a um, half a head of saving. Um, in terms of the other stuff, I think. We've been quite lucky where we haven't had to justify the costs. People can just see that it's good and useful and beneficial. Um, but obviously, if we wanted to invest further, I think we probably would need more um, cost validation to say, well, OK, why would I, as a financial operator, invest that extra money? But yeah, I think we've been quite fortunate in that regard. Gentleman over there. How do we do the governance because of all the different sites and users across the server? Um, well, internally within ours, uh, we manage it at the database level with the Kerberos authentication. So we give all our, like I said, we give all our access um, based on the, the project life cycle system. That's how we determine security. Now other sites do it all independently. And I think centrally IT are trying to look at how they govern it overall. Um, but luckily that's not a problem I'm having to solve. I'll just do my own site and that's okay. <laughs> Okay, so one more question. Um, I don't have any, to be honest. It's probably the central IT team are kind of managing now the resourcing of the licensing and the, the plan. Um, I ask them the same question often. I ask them, when will our eight-core server be insufficient? Um, they, they don't think, well, they haven't told me a date, but that's one of the questions I challenge them on, but because I'm not managing the server as a whole, I don't look at the, the long-term forecast. 
as long as it's performing for me at the moment. But I do challenge them regularly on that. Yeah. Okay, I know um, some of you have to move on. So before you go, I just wanted to say we've got some business cards to hand out um, because we're keen to connect with people who think they might have things they can share with us and we can help you with. So if that's for you, please come and grab a business card. Um, and thank you very much for coming to the talk. Have a great day.